texture, it's the lab and not just my buttery smooth voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hey everybody, Carl here from Apt, and in this video we're going to be talking about some new tech news that's uh, that's come up recently. Probably the biggest story that we had from today is uh, is Sony buying Bungie. This is right on the tail of Microsoft buying Activision Blizzard. Now Microsoft paid almost seventy billion dollars for Activision Blizzard, while Sony got a relatively good steal at three point six billion for Bungie. Now I was actually thinking about purchasing that myself. I didn't want to go over three billion, so I just kind of let Sony have it. So you're welcome. But now the big thing for for Bungie is they. If you're a gamer, you know that they sort of made Halo, and that's a huge franchise on Xbox. Now at the time they were with Xbox exclusively or with Microsoft exclusively. Then they joined up with Activision Blizzard later, and then they separated. And now they're each working for separate companies. Now the big thing, some people might be a little worried because uh, Bungie was is an independent game maker, and if Sony takes them over, now people might be thinking, you know, they're they're only going to make games for PS5. Which, according to what's out there right now, that doesn't seem to be the case. They're going to remain a cross-platform type of brand, so you can expect to have games from Bungie on both the PlayStation, Xbox, who knows, potentially PC and, and even other platforms. So we'll have to see where that goes from there. But uh, it's, it's, it's big news, especially for all you gamers out there. So what do you guys think? Is Sony actually going to, to stick to their word and let them remain independent game makers? Or are they going to kind of force them to only make games for the PS5? Make sure you let us know in the comments section. We want to hear back from you guys. Next, we've got uh, some more Sony news, at least a little bit of Sony news. New TVs. We got a chance to, to keep a, a good eye on CES 2022. So the big news out of CES was these QD OLED TVs. If you followed CES, I'm sure you saw news articles about these. And it's basically using a quantum dot layer to enhance the picture. This is going to allow for brighter pictures on an OLED, more colorful pictures, and that was the, the brightness was really kind of the Achilles heel of OLED TVs, that and, and the potential for, for image retention. But getting a brighter OLED is going to open up a lot of doors, and people I, th I think are going to react very favorably to it, assuming that that technology is, uh, the, the brightness of it doesn't increase any kind of risk of a burn-in image. But only time will tell as far as that's concerned because we don't really have any uh, examples to look at here in person yet. But they're, they're going to come at a higher cost. They're not going to be quite as many models available. And you still have technology like mini LED, QLED, micro LED that are going to be available. So is it worth going to a QD OLED TV? Is that picture going to be good enough to pay that premium over what you would pay for a, a technology that really is already sort of embedded in, uh, in in what we already know. So let us know about that too. Is, is this something you're going to be an early adopter on or are you going to stick with what you know, kind of save the money, go with one of the other technologies that's, that's already uh, sort of established. Finally is the Google Pixel 6a. Stuff has started to leak out about this and it's pretty exciting. I actually, I, I owned a Google Pixel 2 years ago. I loved it. I switched over to an iPhone because of my wife, but uh, what have I done? It's been fine, but I miss the pixel. I miss the format. I miss the, the just that that experience of using that phone and they've gotten just better and better as the as the series has gone on. Now the Pixel 6 has has had some issues. It's had some bugs regarding Wi-Fi intermittently dropping out and Bluetooth not hooking up right and even some uh, even some audio issues and things. So there's been little little hiccups with it and they've been good about coming out with patches for it, but each patch sort of seems to create a new problem to solve. So the Pixel 6a could potentially be cutting some features out that maybe make it a little bit better. Maybe maybe negates some of those flaws that were in the Pixel 6. We'll only we'll find out once it's available uh, because it's it's not here for us to test out yet, but we'll have to see. With all the issues of the Pixel 6, are you a little nervous about the 6a? Are they going to be able to work those bugs out so they give you a uh, a lower priced phone with a, a good looking camera and with enough features to make you want to get it? Or are you are you a 5A owner? Did you buy the 5A? Do you like the 5A? 
And if so, would you upgrade to the 6A or are you gonna wait till something better comes out? Or do you have an iPhone like, like me? I would potentially switch over to something like this because I like that interface so much. But uh, let us know that down in the comments too. We wanna hear if you guys are uh, willing to switch from an iPhone to the 6A or uh, even willing to switch from, from iPhone to, to Google. Finally, we wanted to address some of the questions that we get in our comments section for our other videos because sometimes we don't have a chance to, to get to all those, so we wanted to sort of try and address them here. So the first question is uh, the Samsung Q800A versus the JBL Bar 9.1, which is worth it? I would say they're both worth it. The JBL Bar 9.1 comes with everything you need right out of the box. There's no additional purchases that need to be made. You've got your surround speakers for behind, and you've got the main soundbar subwoofer. The Q800A is a 3.1.2 channel system right out of the box. So you have your soundbar and you have your subwoofer. You don't get those surround speakers in the box. You can purchase them separately if you want to, but that's an additional, it's an additional order you're gonna have to make. However, the JBL Bar 9.1 is about $400 more than the Q800A. So is it worth spending a little, uh, a little extra to get that JBL versus the Samsung and having to also add those extra surround speakers. Maybe, it's just for ease of use with having everything in, in the one box is good. You do also have the option to, if you're gonna spend that extra 400 and go up to that JBL Bar 9.1, you could also go to the Samsung Q950A, which is a very similar setup where you get those surround speakers. But those surround speakers need to be plugged in all the time. The JBL Bar 9.1, the advantage there, those surround speakers are battery operated, so they don't need to plug in if you don't want them to. Uh, the, other, the other thing that Samsung has over JBL is Q-Symphony. So if you have a Q-Symphony television from Samsung and you hook it up to the Q800A, you're gonna be able to take advantage of that Q-Symphony feature, which just makes things sound a little bit fuller. Now, on that topic is our next question, or a lot of people state my Q-Symphony feature isn't working. And a lot of times what we've found to, to be the cause of that is you're trying to connect your soundbar to the TV with Bluetooth. That feature doesn't work when you're using Bluetooth. You have to be plugged in with an optical Bingo. cable or an HDMI cable. So make sure if you're having trouble with that and you're watching this video, that might be something you want to try to sort of take care of that problem. And then finally, uh, with the uh, with the big game coming up, the football game, I think you know which one I'm talking about. It's the, uh, what are the best settings to watch sports on on my TV? It's a very personal thing. Uh, for me, I like to turn the motion settings off on my TVs because I find sports just look a little more natural that way with a little bit of the blur that you get when the motion features are turned off. And then I like to turn off the ambient light sensors and my TV. Occasionally it flickers back and forth between bright and dark and it's just a little distracting. It's not the end of the world but if you're looking for the best experience I would recommend probably turning that feature off if you don't like having that little bit of a flicker when the lighting changes in the room. Not a big deal, but something to check out. The other thing too is maybe Try putting it in the different preset modes. I, I generally leave mine in cinema mode. Uh, there's TVs out there that have an ISF calibrated mode for light rooms and dark rooms. Uh, any kind of cinema style mode is gonna look good, in my opinion. Other people might, uh, might not share that same one, but that's what I've found to look the best. What, what do you guys think? What do you guys turn your TVs to when you're watching sports? Make sure you let us know that in the comments too. So that's all we have for today. Thank you guys for watching. We appreciate it. Make sure you leave any questions or comments down in the comment section, and we'll see you in the next one.